you can hear my voice okay with this microphone. <laughs> la, 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 la. No. <laughs> okay, we're ready. Um, in this first presentation, we're going to talk about the nuts and bolts of con consultation, consultation process, and look at the requirements and uh, associated with uh, Section 7, A2, and the regulations. Section 7A2. Okay, so for this session, this is what we would what we want to try to achieve. We want to understand the process for initiating, initiating consultation and find out first who can consult and which office you should contact. The purpose of the species list. We've kind of talked about this already, but we'll go over it. Again, what is a biological assessment? When do you need a biological assessment to initiate consultation? The components of a biological assessment and how Section 7D affects the federal agency's action once consultation has been initiated. So who consults with the service? It's the federal agency that is proposing the action or their non-federal representative that has been designated in writing by the agency to the service. So this is kind of review. We've heard this before. And who is the federal, it already says it right there, but who is the designated federal representative of federal highways? You guys, the DOT. Who is not a fed designated federal representative of federal highways or, or the core? Your consultants. <laughs> so when I get a request from a consultant that says, can we have concurrence? I'm going to have to say, sorry, I can't give you. Okay, so just, just keep that in mind. All right, so you have an action, and you're ready to consult with the service. So who do you contact? A lot of you probably already know this, but it doesn't hurt to review it. If, you're, if your project's located in South Florida, anywhere from the Keys to as far north as Polk County, Osceola County, that's in, in that case, you would contact the Vero Beach office, our office. Um, if your project is located in North Florida, um, and including as far south as Brevard, Hillsboro, and Manatee counties, and I'm not sure what the, co the county border is for the Panhandle, but as far northwest as the Panhandle, then you would contact the Jacksonville office. And if, your con and if your action is located within the Panhandle, contact Mary Mitica at the Panama City office, and she'll be very glad to hear from you. <laughs> I had a very good question the other day when I was practicing this talk with our new biologist, Sean Tupi, and he asked, well, what happens if you have an action that's located within a county of, for example, North Florida, the North Florida area of responsibility, and the Vero Beach area of responsibility? Well, in that case, send, send your request for initiation of consultation to both offices, and then we'll decide, we'll talk, the biologists will talk to each other and decide who takes the lead for the project. Okay, well, so what's the first step in initiating consultation for the federal agency or their designated representative? You guys want to know what species, what listed species are in your action area and you want to know what designated critical habitat is in your action area. So you provide the service with a written request for a list of those, those of the listed species and proposed species or the designated or proposed critical habitat that may be present in the action area of your project. Conversely, you can also provide the service with a list of those resources, including the Federal, uh, federally listed species and critical habitat that you are going to include in your biological opinion. So you can either ask for a species list or provide us with a list. What do we do? And then 30 days we respond by providing you the species list. And it includes any federal, federally listed species under the act that may be, that we feel may be located in your action area. Uh, any uh, proposed species or critical habitat, 
and any candidate species that might be located in the action area. So again, what are proposed species? Proposed species are those species that have been listed under the federal reg register that the service intends to list them. They're proposed to be listed, but they don't. But, but they're not yet listed. And candidate species are those that the service has enough information to indicate that those species should be listed. They're warranted to be listed, but due to other oblig listing obligations, we haven't yet listed them. We've been busy. Both candidate species and pr proposed species don't have any federal protection under the Act, but for candidate species, we encourage that the DOT engage in measures to conserve the species and work with, with the service cooperatively <coughs> to do that. Okay, so we respond by providing you a species list or concurring with the list that you provided or we provide you a revised list. Oops, one backwards. Okay, verification of that species list. If the federal agency or the representative does not begin preparation of their biological opinion within 90 days of, of receipt or concurrence with the species list, they must verify with the service that that list is accurate. So again, you're trying to, we're trying to make sure you have the most accurate information on species and critical habitat to do your consultation. We talked in length about species lists, but in practice we don't do that anymore. Nobody asked for a species list. I haven't seen a species list in request in 14 years. It's still in the reg. Some offices do, do ask for, for species lists. We don't. We, we, I don't think any, do you, Lourdes or Mary, you don't do it, do you? No. Um, and and the, that is, the regs were written prior to the invention of the internet. So now we have all this information online and you can find that information at the various websites for the three offices in Florida and with what we mentioned before, um, the, the information for planning and conservation site that the service has. And again, we strive, we work real hard to try to keep these up to date and, and complete. I also should indicate if you guys have any questions, go ahead and raise your hands or just yell out. Doesn't seem like anybody has any questions yet. But okay. What's a biological assessment? A BA is defined as, in the regs, as information prepared by or under the direction of the federal agency concerning listed species and proposed species and designated or proposed critical habitat in the action area of the action the proposed action. Remember, it's a proposed action. You're not supposed to do that. Do this after you start the action. Still proposed. Biological assessments contain an evaluation of the potential effects of the action on listed species and their critical habitat. All right, so does your project require the preparation um, of a biological assessment? A BA is required if your action is a major construction activity. And we define a major construction activity as a construction project or a similar undertaking which is a major, major federal action significantly affecting the quality of the human environment. And this definition is provided in NEPA. So if you're project is a major construction project that significantly affects the quality of the human environment, you need to prepare a biological assessment. Examples. Most DOT projects are major construction projects. If you're building a new roadway or if you're widening a roadway from two to four lanes, major construction project. What's a minor construction project or activity? Resurfacing an existing road, roadway, not a big deal. Construction of a new sidewalk, minor construction activity. Okay, so what are the contents of the biological assessment? Those are up to the discretion of the federal agency. But the regs recommend that they include results of on-site inspections of the area affected by the action to determine if listed species are present or occur seasonally 
the views of recognized experts on species at issue, and a review of the literature and other information on the species that are potentially affected, an analysis of the effects of the actions on the species and habitat, it's important, including consideration of cumulative effects and the results of any related studies on the species. And finally, an analysis of any alternative actions that have been considered by the federal ag agency for the proposed action. So you consider alternative actions as well. Um, also, I, see, I recommend that you include a very detailed uh, project description with your biological assessment. assessment. Make sure when I read it, I can understand very well what you intend to do, where you intend to do it, why, when, how, with, with the description. There are time frames for biological assessment. Well, the federal agency or its representative must complete the biological assessment with a hun within 180 days after it starts, after you, if you init after you initiate it, unless the service and the federal agency agree to some sort of extension. If an action is involved, 180-day period may not be extended unless the federal agency provides an applicant before the close of the 180-day period with a written statement setting forth the length of the extension and the reasons why such an extension is needed. <clears throat> the service must respond, and upon receiving a biological assessment, the service must respond within 30 days as to whether we believe or as whether we concur with the findings of the assessment. That's pretty straightforward. What else do we need to know about biological assessment? They are required for actions that affect species in critical habitat proposed to be listed, which we already mentioned. And when, you have a question, Brian. The, um, if this is the 180 days from when it's issued, does that have to be, I guess, the application, or what's the, what's the, uh, I, I assume. Yeah, supposedly you're supposed to submit to me when you initiate uh, the, the writing of the biological opinion. In practice, maybe Jerry can answer that, because in practice we don't really do that. But There, there aren't any uh, uh, BA initiation cops out there uh, to mark this, but it's only relevant to when you're, uh, the species list that you're using, you know, for that that uh, biological assessment. You need to, this is why if you go online to one of the websites and get a species list that way, you know, here's the, our project in such and such county, this is the species list for that county, um, and you need to date that. You know, we access that website on this date. You need to get that BA started relative to that list. Um, uh, within, what was it, 90 days? Uh, and then if you're not done within 180 days after that, then, you know, you, you really probably need to, to revisit, you know, are there new species? It's, it's probably a good idea to just, you know, as you're going through a lengthy preparation of an assessment, you know, to be in communication with the field office, uh, check their websites, you know, uh, is anything changing? Uh, and uh, but that's the main reason. It's it's so that the information is timely, uh, that it's not stale. Uh, but nobody's going to be. I'm not. I'm not aware of anyone saying no. You this PA is invalid because you didn't finish it within 180 days of the of some date. Is this the same process that you would submit to the timeframe? Yeah. Yeah, these are these. The, we we share these regu same regulations with NIMS. Uh, I should mention that. Yeah, the, there's they have a there's a few differences with NIMS, but this is the this basic stuff is the same. When we're when we're citing 50 CFR 402, those are their regs too. Uh, they have some like they have a different definition of harm than we do, you know, and a few other things are different, you know, how they how they treat uh, candidates. Um, what they call a candidate, uh, and so on. 
but uh, in terms of the the consultation procedures, they're they're the same. Okay, uh, where were we? Um, what else about biological assessments? Um, they're required also if the action agency wants to get or applicant wants to get an exemption to the Section 7A2 process. In other words, their project is likely to result in jeopardy to a listed species and they want to go forward with that project. Um, that, can, that can be done. It is done through uh, a committee, the Endangered Species Committee, also known as the God Squad. I think I got that right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it doesn't happen very often. When was the last time that happened? I, I think it might have been Teleco Dam. I'm not sure. Yeah, it was like the um, 70s or something. I, I want to clarify something here that's on this slide too. BAs are required for actions that affect species that are proposed and critical habitats proposed. Um, that's if you want to deal with those as though using the, the formal consultation procedures. Um, if it's and we'll talk about conferences for proposed species because it's different. It's different. It's not the same. Uh, but if you want to deal with a proposed species and get concurrence and an opinion before it's actually listed that would be kind of ready to go just with a quick review at the time the species is listed, then yes, you have to do a BA. But you don't have to do, do one. Um, uh, it's not required. Uh, because the only conference for proposed species that's required is if you determine we're going to jeopardize this species or we're going to adversely modify this critical habitat. That's the only situation in which you have to get with us. Uh, otherwise, you can admin record, you know, say, yeah, we're, we're going to affect this proposed species, but, you know, we decided not to confer with the services. Uh, and you could do that. I don't advise that. Um, and I think it's a good idea. And we'll talk about conferences tomorrow uh, in the variation session number 15, I think. So, but anyway, it's not exactly correct that BAs are required for proposed stuff. Uh, but they are if you want to get the early consultation, you know, a sort of a preliminary BO for them, a conference opinion. Thanks. That was a good point. Um, all right. Uh, I'll, sorry. I'm just going to say, you know, for DOT, when uh, the major projects, we usually do the biological assessment during our PE process, and uh, the BO is developed then before we move, before we finalize the PE or the NEPA document. And on the minor projects, the 3R projects, we would do that. Um, he called them minor projects, but we have a bridge replacement in kind, or we have a research project that's still hitting critical habitat. We would do that document during the at 60% plan. So um, prior to permitting, or we try to get it done before permitting. In some cases, if we have um, state-only funds, then we might do the uh, Section 7 consultation as a part of the core permit and not have a standalone VA, VO. Uh, independent of the permit process. So, and like the one he was talking about, we in the panhandle we had, you know, all those mussels get listed. We knew they were coming. We knew that um, the environmental document was a year or so ahead of when we'd be going to permitting. And but we knew by the time we got into construction that the mussels would probably be would be up and available. And so as we went through that step. We went ahead and consulted with Mary, and it wasn't, you know, a consult, consult, but we we did some things like, okay, if it's going to be, if it's listed by the time you go to construction, you're going to have to do this and this and this. If it's not listed, then you just, you know, do something else. But you know, we we knew it was coming. We just couldn't tell exactly when the job was going to get built, and so there was some kind of phasing in process for those species. Okay. Um, what else about biological assessments? They're not required when federally listed species or critical habitat are not present on or near your action site. What about actions that don't require biological assessments? 
these are projects that are not major construction activities. However, they still require consultation under this act if the action agency or the representative finds that the action may affect a listed species or its critical habitat. DAs and species lists are not... Yeah, go ahead. I just want to make a statement on the major construction activities. You made a statement that most uh, DOT projects are major construction activities. My knowledge, the main, you're, you're saying they're not. Oh, okay. Well, the ones I see. Yeah, my, my definition. <laughs> Thousands of those minors. Yeah, so, so, and by definition, they use uh, significant in NEPA. So mm -hmm. that would translate to, in um, NEPA speak, an EIS. Okay. So as, as a regulation is written, if you're doing an EIS, it has to be called a VA. If you're not doing a BIS, frankly, the regulation doesn't say anything where it has to be called. You still can call it a VA, and we still encourage you to do that. But I know you all have a process here, and you may call it something different. The information is probably going to be exactly the same, I mean, because you still have to do the analysis. Uh, so whether you call it a BA, George, Peter, Harry, it doesn't really matter that much, except in the context of an EIS, they have to be called a BA. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so BAs, uh, BAs and species, species lists are not required for minor construction activities, but uh, sufficient information should be provided to the service so we're able to consult on it and understand the project. Just to make the point here, for all consultations, 7 to 8, 2 of the Act requires that each federal agency use the best scientific and commercial data available when consulting with the service. Just, just, just to remind you again. Okay, what cannot be done once consultation is initiated? Section 7D of the Act prohibits the action agency or applicant from making an irreversible or irretrievable commitment of resources which have the effect of foreclosing the formulation, creation, or implementation of a reasonable and prudent alternative that would avoid jeopardizing the species. So if you have, so if you go forward with an action that takes out an alternative that could avoid jeopardy, because the consultation's not over yet, that's prohibited by the Act. Examples of compliance and non-compliance with Section 7D. Um, let's say you have the DOT creates a plan to build a roadway. Is the creation of a plan, the drafting of a, a highway plan, is that in compliance with Section 7D? Yes because you can rip up the plans and start over. It doesn't preclude an alternative that would uh, affect, you know, would, would preclude uh, jeopardy. What's not compliance? When the federal agency or the applicant initiates, initiates, initiates construction and proceeds with construction of a major highway. So that does not comply with the act. That would constitute an irreversible or irretrievable commitment of resources. And remember that Section 7D applies for the entire period of consultation. DOT is normally pretty good about do it, do, do, not doing those types of things. They usually wait till they get all their ducks in a row, all their permits and their consultation complete before they proceed with any kind of construction activities. Questions? What are the chances? <laughs> All right, you walk me through the timeline again. So basically, you request a species list, and then you guys have 30 days to respond. And right. And then you have 180 days to prepare the VA. Right. And then you guys have 30 days to respond with the BO. No, no. This just happens, has, has to do with the, the requirement that you're supposed to indicate that we received the, B, the, this, the biological assessment, and we think it's okay. Okay. Uh, the information submitted was correct. Yeah. You're just you're choosing the report to say that yes, you did address all the species. Yeah. So it's but a more, technically, more time. Yeah. For practical matter, we we don't really do that. 
those requirements, uh, even though they're in the regs. We just, I mean, we'd let you know when you initiate consultation whether you can, you consider all the species you need to do this. So we, that's what we typically do. But those are in the regs, so we needed to talk about them. Isn't that kind of what we do in ETAT, though? I mean, we're kind of... ETAT, yeah, that yeah, work. that's, a, that's a, a means to provide you information on the listed species that are, can be affected by your project. It's early planning. So yeah, so you're right. Kind of letting you know. Early planning on what I think, you know, what I think of the project, what species are there, what I recommend you guys do, you know, any any concerns that we have <laughs> about it. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's correct. Um, can I say something? Uh, Katasha was pointing out to me the slide where it says, you know, we have we will respond to you in 30 days whether we concur with the finding. Um, uh, if you give us something called a biological assessment or a biological evaluation or whatever you want to call it, like Brian was saying, it doesn't really matter. Um, you just have to describe the action and what species it may affect and the manner in which it may affect those species and, and habitat. Uh, it, it, we don't really care what you call it, uh, but the regs do have a label. You must call it a BA if it's an EIS. But when you give us that assessment, whatever it's called, uh, we we need to get back to you within 30 days to say we got it. We got some determinations in there. Oh, did I lose my mic? No, here it is. We have some. Uh, determinations in there that say likely to, not likely to adversely affect. We need to tell you whether we concur with those um, or not, and if not, say why. And, uh, and if you have some likely to adversely affect determinations in there, we need to tell you whether you've given us everything we need to issue formal consultation, and if not, what more we need, but if we've got everything we need, then we tell you the time frame for that formal consultation. You know, we received your request for formal consultation on such and such a date, and in the, uh, 135 days is when we'll give you uh, a final BO, not later then, unless we agree to an extension. Uh, but that's what that 30-day response is. You give us that basic information that's, that has your determinations in it, and, and what and the information that's required to support those determinations and to initiate formal consultation, uh, and uh, and we tell you if it's if it's good or not if we're we're good to go. Just for clarification, that 30 days for the notification back to the applicant is that part of the 135 day time frame or not? Yes, it is. So. That is subtracted from the 135. So you've got 105 days after you notice us to produce a video. Yes. Secretary, that only if we during the letter to you all say we should constitute. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you don't you, you, know, you can't just send us a BA with with like you know with not telling us what you want to do. <laughs> uh, you need to actually. Here's, here's the thing, you know, consultation is always two parties, uh, and we can't start it. Uh, the services can't say consultation has begun. You have to ask for it. Even if we think you need to reinitiate a consultation, we can't make you do it. You have to ask for it. So, so your, your communication to the service always has to say, this is what we need. We need to, we want, we need to initiate consultation, uh, and we think we can conclude it informally, uh, and here's why, using the optional procedures at 50 CFR 402.13, or uh, we want to request formal consultation and get an opinion. So you have to tell us what you want. Um, and, and the BA is the package of information that supports those requests. And we get back to you within 30 days to tell you whether Yep, you've done what you need to do, and we're following. Here's how we're going to answer your request. And if we say we can't concur, the ball's back in your court to, all right, what uh, we then need to request formal consultation or do a better job of supporting that, that not likely to adversely affect determination. 
But the day we receive that request, and if it's complete, is the start of the, of the clock for the 30 days to reply with, with acknowledgement of receipt and, and concurrence and or, uh, and or the 135 days for a, an opinion. National Marine Fisheries is under that same timeline. Yeah, they're not so good at it. <laughs> <laughs> at, uh, and we're, we're not, uh, you know, 100% on those time frames also. Uh, but, hey, we're all, we won't hold you to the 180-day thing if you uh, give us some slack on that. Uh, the, the, time, the, the time frames become uh, important in you know, our are really more important is when, when we have a third party, an applicant involved. I guess you guys always have been a third party, so so we really should be on the stick with these time frames. Um, but limited staff, we do the best we can. Uh, we really do, in the Fish and Wildlife Service, try to get, respect those 30-day those and 135-day and uh, time frames. And, uh, and if we look at our own data of, of our bean counting database, um, we're pretty good at it. We're, you know, more than 90% of our stuff is timely. We find it helpful to go meet with, uh, well, Lourdes mostly and review the project once we submit the assessment, go over the project if there's any questions and if yeah. we communicate frequently, phone and email. Don't just send it and wait for, you know. And in, in the defense of NOAA Fisheries, uh, they have a much smaller staff uh, to deal with. Uh, they have fewer species, but uh, they still get, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm wondering about proportions. It would be interesting to look at numbers of consultation requests per species that they get versus us and, and how much staff we have to deal with that workload. Uh, but uh, yeah, they are sort of famously not on time with the 30 days and the 135 days. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, it's not because they're not trying. And just one point I want to make is that even though there's regulatory time frames of when the service has to respond, when they have to give you uh, concurrence, when they have to uh, put out a BO, if they miss those dates, that doesn't mean you have a freebie chance to go off and do whatever you want. You still have to wait. I mean, there's not. There's not a great amount of teeth in saying that just because they missed their deadline, we can go and proceed in our action. We still have to wait. We still have the obligation to wait until we conclude those consultations. It does give you some leverage, though, to you know to complain to mommy and daddy uh, that uh, you know those guys over in Panama City are dragging their heels. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to point out, at least with Fish and Wildlife Service, we do have a um, memorandum of agreement uh, if we come into dispute, so where time frames are too long, that you can elevate it through the process to get things done, and even projects that are stuck. Um, one thing we don't want is projects to linger on for years and years because they're arguing over some facet of the project and that doesn't, doesn't do anyone any good. So there is there is um, some protocol set up for that. Well. Okay, and on that note, we're going to talk more about concurrence. We're going to again talk about understanding the purpose of the concurrence letter. Can't hear you, Lord. Uh, Not better? Sorry, I talk with my hands and probably going to be moving <laughs> around everywhere. Do you want the lapel thing? No, oh, I'm good. It's John Lester here. It's okay. It actually will help me just leave my hand there. So um, we're going to talk about what is the concurrence letter, um, again, what information is needed in a request for concurrence, and what role do the service play in this process. And we just want to make it very clear, so we're just going to keep repeating it. Um, so what is the concurrence letter? Um, we talked about having the applicant 
uh, provide in enough information so that when they make a determination of a proposed action as a may affect, not likely to adversely affect, to listed species or a critical habitat, we can actually conclude the consultation there with the information you provide and provide you that concurrence letter that says, yes, we agree with your determination. Um, and we're going to talk about, again, the effects determinations that Mary mentioned yesterday. So when the effect is entirely beneficial to the species, insignificant or discountable, formal consultation will not be required or is not required. Um, so again, the entirely beneficial effects are those that possess no adverse effects to the species. So we're talking about 100% beneficial to the species. Not 90%, 100%, so black and white. It has to be completely beneficial to the species or to the habitat. Insignificant effects are those that are minor, that so that they are not meaningfully affecting the species or the critical habitat, um, and they cannot be measured, detector, detected, or evaluated. And um, in this example, um, we can probably go back to um, the example with the bats that was mentioned earlier, where if you have a existing road where you maintain it, there's no trees, and a species like a, ha a bat is using that habitat, you are probably not going to find it there. So even though it is within its range, your um, effect determination might be, oh, it will be, it will be insignificant because they will not be there. Um, and on, around those lines, discountable effects are those that are extremely unlikely to occur, which in this case, is exactly what I just explained. Um, so in summary, no effect would be the end of the process. If you make, make a no effect determination, you, that's the end of the process. And again, this is pretty much black and white. It's no effect at all to the species, so it cannot be found there. It's, it's a manatee and you're looking at an upland. That would be a no effect determination. <laughs> and it may affect determination if it's not likely to adversely affect, then you would ask for a concurrence from the services. And if it's uh, likely to adversely affect, then we would go in, into formal consultation. This is a little chart just to visualize it, so it may affect. If we go to not likely to adversely affect, we finalize it with, with an informal consultation and a concurrence with, from the services. If it's a likely to adversely affect, it's a formal consultation and you, you, we would be um, writing a biological opinion for that project after you request for it. And um, so, the, so what is the information that we need? in the request for concurrence, as detailed as possible, um, a list of the species or critical habitat in the action area, um, what is the action area, the proposed, what is the proposed project, and what are the effects of that proposed project on the species and the habitat within the action area. In the process, um, you should also talk about all of those things that you're doing to reduce or avoid um, adverse effects to the species. So anything, any conservation measure that you're including in the project so that the effects are, minimi you're minimizing effects to the species, um, please include them in that request. Um, and you have to make sure that the measures are actually um, things that are doable and that I say that because sometimes in our meetings we sit and we discuss a project that we think it's a may affect and we kind of brainstorm into possibilities of okay what things can we do to minimize the effects to get in, to a not likely and we're biologists we're not engineers and we might make crazy requests like, well, can you put this here? And you're like, no, that's going to cost me billions of dollars. I cannot do that. So make that point across to us, too. Um, I don't know how many times I've actually asked for things that I have no idea how you can physically do it. And then when it's explained back, I'm like, OK, yes, that's probably not doable. But those things that you do add, in, um, in the request, and um, you know, through the process, we always discuss some of these things. Um, 
make sure that it's pretty well described on how that measure is providing some protective measures for the species. So what role do we play, the services play in the process? Um, we review your request. Um, we discuss the proposed action if necessary. That's when we call you and we request either a meeting or a site visit because we either don't understand some component of your request or we don't agree with the survey or we want a separate survey because we think that your action area is a little bit larger than what you're um, putting in your request. And we should respond within the 30 days. Um, when we request, and, um, and this is different, this is probably one of um, the inconsistencies, uh, when we request a site visit, during the site visit, we might also request for additional time for more of those 30 days because now we have new information. So just keep that in mind. And the possible outcomes of your request for concurrence might be, yes, we concur with you. Uh, we need more discussions of the proposed action. Or no, we do not concur. And we either think that it should go to a formal consultation or we might think that it's actually a, um, a no effect <coughs> because sometimes we get projects that um, some species are identified there and the species is really not found in the area. I've actually had that happen. So it could go either way. Do you guys have any questions? I, that was a whirlwind of concurrence. <laughs> No questions. So I have a question. What do you need to include in the concurrence letter? In a request? Yes. In your request for concurrence, sorry. Proposed effects determination? And yes. a reason why? Rationale. Okay. Action area and how detailed? Enough so that we don't give you a call, right? <laughs> I would say as detailed as necessary. Uh, focus on the important stuff. We don't need an encyclopedia for something very simple. Uh, so uh, put yourself in our shoes. Uh, what would you want to know to say to give your agencies the stamp of uh, agreement? on something, well, you kind of want to know, first of all, what species are we talking about here? What critical habitats? Uh, what are you doing that might affect them? Uh, how might that affect them? <clears throat> What's your support for a, a response uh, that is, you know, insignificant or discountable? Uh, and, uh, you know, what do we need to know to agree? With you, uh, I got a I got a request from a, an agency I will not name uh, recently about a fairly large action affecting a large area, uh, potentially dozens of species. Uh, can we uh, we we request your concurrence with not likely to adversely affect for this big action? <laughs> and uh, they didn't say concurrence with what. <laughs> <laughs> What's, which species are we talking about here? Uh, they didn't do any of the work to say to filter out the no effects, you know, for example. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, we, we need to know these specifics. But you guys should be you're, with the transportation liaison positions and the ETDM. Um, by the time you get to actually, you know, formally requesting our feedback in Section 7 consultation for either concurrence or, or an opinion or both, um, we should have talked already and uh, exchanged these information needs. Uh, here's what we should be telling you what we think might be a problem. We should be telling you <coughs> where we think you need to look for information. You just need to be asking us stuff. Um, such that when that request for 
concurrence or an opinion comes, uh, we already know. You, you, you should, there shouldn't be any surprises <laughs> in what you get back. Uh, that's how it should work. Uh, but the regs don't necessarily foresee that kind of upfront working. It's, you know, we have to codify a process and it has to have certain milestones in it. Uh, so you're getting, you're getting the milestones here that are codified in process, but recognize that, you know, you can make those milestones uh, happen, you know, very smoothly. If you're, if you understand the process and you know what we need and, 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 and we know what you need. She's in charge. Uh, <laughs> when we write the biological assessments that are in the ESBA, uh, we've had some consultants that throw uh, the kitchen sink as far as like the number of commitments to try and make uh, consultation go as quickly as possible. Uh, I'm wondering if there's some way we could have more discussion on, on what would be a, a, a suitable commitment to ensure um, avoidance and minimization activities. Uh, that makes sense. I, that's one area I know we always struggle with is what types of commitments we should be putting into the PD documents. We commit to the survey for a very yeah. and that's fine if we've already decided to go formal on um, a project you know, because we don't want to decide to take a certain construction. But if it's to get concurrence, it's not going to work for us because we need to know before we confer whether or not there are any characters here or whether they're not. So in some cases, those commitments are good, but I don't know that they, <coughs> they, they weren't at getting confirms on the surface. Okay. So in that case, if you tell them we are going to survey, also tell them if you find them, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. Okay. And that might get you to the next level of um, conversation, not necessarily a concurrence then, because you're going to still have to tell them, or in case John, <laughs> I know you're in his neck of the woods, um, you're going to have to tell them we did find them, so now there's presence, and depending on the level of the activity you're going to do, it's either going to be informal or formal, depending on what you're going to do to minimize those impacts. Right, John? I think so. <laughs> from the ESBAs that you've seen from, from our youth, generally you think that they are kind of over the top, or you think that they can be no, I, no, they're they're fine. I just want to, my big deal is making sure I understand what you want to do. And in some cases, when I get uh, a request from DOT for consultation, I can't. You know, it says we propose the uh, activity for improvements to something. Well, what are those improvements? Okay. That's what I'm that's what I'm looking for. So when I say detailed, I mean detailed information so I can understand what you guys are doing. Like, like Jerry said, you don't have to go over the top. You don't have to write. Uh, 20 pages on the life history of a listed species. That's not necessary. <laughs> but in that case, it's an example, very simple example would be, and I know resurfacing are minor, minor projects, but if you're resurfacing an area, you can say, you know, we're resurf resurfacing this area and we're going to stage here, and these are the areas that we're going to potentially disturb during the process as we go along and, you know, and all the things, all the minor details maybe to you that will go into the action of the work within that area. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> I have a question about determining critical habitat because if you go in ICAC, there's a pretty hefty disclaimer. I mean, if, if you're in the middle of critical habitat, it's not an issue. <laughs> but if you're near the margins or it's indeterminate whether you're in critical habitat, you've got ICAC and you look, and it says, you know, it shows you in GIS and you can zoom in and out, and then it tells you, you know, well, we can't guarantee the accuracy of this. So you're left with, you know, you can go back to the Federal Register notice and you look at that, and there's the very small little figures. You still can't tell if you're in it. How does the service actually, if, if it's 
indeterminate and you're not really sure, how does the service determine whether you're actually in critical habitat? The viewer might not be giving you enough zoom in information <clears throat> for the specific delineation. The field offices should have that information. The GIS, the yeah. actual GIS layers, okay. Right? Yeah, uh, we 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 have we have to uh, identify uh, it on the map, and in, it's one point in in the some administration was requiring us to actually publish coordinates and pages and pages right. in the Federal Register of each little point on a polygon. That yeah, uh, and uh, uh, but yeah, it is we we nowadays anytime there's a critical habitat. Designation. We're we're putting it in a uh, uh, a GIS data layer, and uh, so and that's what should be displayed on IPAC. But I think what Lourdes is saying is that the viewer uh, that that yeah you you probably need to like actually download it. I think it's because it's the interface that can't guarantee that it's working properly. Yeah, it might not check the reference properly. Right. Uh, uh, but uh, if you're real close to the edge of one of those critical habitat boundaries, you know, you, it's, there could be indirect effects that extend beyond the, the footprint of your project that, that might influence those physical and biological features. Uh, Rob? Yeah, I, I was just going to say that um, for the newer critical habitat designations, if you go into regulations.gov and you can look at the Docket all the information on, on rulemaking. Um, oftentimes, they're, we're supposed to publish the uh, coordinates within. You know, they're not actually in the Federal Register notice anymore, but they're they're you know they're provided in the docket so that you can see the information made available to the public. And there's also unit descriptions that are in the the, the rule that also can help. You know, sometimes it's not perfect. I admit, you know, some of those maps are not ideal, but if you look at the map with the unit description, that kind of helps helps as well. Yeah, and I don't know if Florida has done this, but we did get a request some time back where we were supposed to provide the GIS file to IPAC, but um, I, I don't think a lot of offices have actually gone that far. A lot of offices don't have an actual GIS person in place. Yes? Yeah. I guess same question on the informal consultation in front of letters. What's the, what's the time frame? What's the, the schedule in terms of like when we submit the request? What does the service have a the yeah. obligation or requirement for when they need to respond? Or we have 30 days to respond. Is that 30 days with the concurrence or I guess those three one of those three items or what is the the 30 days uh, is for the concurrence unless we go talk to you because there wasn't enough information in there to make the determination. And we then tell you it's going to take a little bit longer because we didn't have the sufficient information. Or we'll tell you within 30 days that you haven't given us what we need to answer your request. Yeah. Um, I, I have a question for you all. Um, say uh, your project is, uh, uh, this is an issue in, in a bunch of places in a lot of situations. Say um, you have a migratory listed species, and uh, um, it's present in your action area, uh, you know, seasonally, and and uh, you propose to do your project, which will uh, remove some of the habitat features that it uses when it's there uh, during the season when when the the animal is not there. Is that a, a likely to adversely affect, or is that a not likely to adversely affect situation? Is it critical habitat? It is not critical habitat. But you have to write it that way in your letter. You have to say, uh, you describe your prop action area, and you describe that you're going to only do this work outside of the if I was to burn your house down, 
when you were on vacation. Would that be an adverse effect on your lifestyle? <laughs> well, no, no, no. The, the, the situation I was describing was we're, we're going to remove some habitat that we know the species uses. Yeah. Yeah. If you're removing it, that's different. I just thought you were. Good question. Yeah, defiance. Yeah. Yeah. How much? That becomes relevant. Are we removing a tenth of an acre or a hundred acres? Uh, what do we know about that habitat? Do we have specific data that, yes, it, you know, it is a, a, uh, a nesting location? Um, uh, so things like that. But yeah, adverse effects can happen. You know, you have to look at the resources on which the species relies, and in, in critical habitat, you're, that's all you're looking at. Uh, and so the timing of when the species is gone doesn't uh, matter. Uh, if you're, like I said, if I'm going to burn your house down, you're gone on vacation, you'll notice that when you come back. Uh, yeah. But, but then the questions about, you know, how much, you know, is there other habitat available? Um, you know, how flexible is that species? You know, do they always return to the same spot or there every year is a different spot they use? So these are the nuances that enter that question. But just because the critter's not there when you do something to its habitat doesn't mean it's a, not an adverse effect. You know, if you had a party in the house and all the straws, it would be like your trash. They say that. What? I don't see a lot of noise, for example, when you get away from the set. You're doing the noise, like outside of that season, you would probably have no effect. Right, 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 right. If you had a party at my house while I was on vacation, but you had your trash, and I had no idea. Yeah, you can't harass a species if it's not there. Right. But you can harm it. And remember the definition of harm uh, is habitat alteration. That, you know, leads to an injury, uh, such as reproductive failure, because where I used to make babies is no longer there. Do you have a public survey methodology for certain species? Yes, yes. And that, that is the sort of thing we tend to put on our office websites um, uh, and you know these are we call them survey protocols for various species we, they're not out there for all species uh, John mentioned yesterday that it's really hard to get a good one for eastern indigo snakes because they're just there just isn't uh, so uh, but for some, we do have, like sand skinks, there is a survey methodology. Um, you know, red cockaded woodpeckers, uh, uh, caracara, so on. Uh, and, uh, and, if, and we encourage, but you are not required, uh, to use those protocols. But if you do use them and you, you know, get negative results, it's hard to prove a negative. Uh, but we, if you've done things according to the protocol that we have 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 approved, um, we will accept that as evidence that okay, uh, that that negative survey result will support a, you know, uh, not likely adversely affect finding uh, because it's otherwise suitable habitat for the species. I was just going to say we also. Um help guide survey protocols through our conservation permits that we issue when Jerry was talking about section 10 of the act and we people have to be permitted to go out and, and do you know intentionally take or you know harm species in the, in the name of conservation we we actually have the conditions and the permits that are standard for bats for instance in the way that they are supposed to conduct uh, the surveys Did you want to say it, that, that, his question is, um, you know, how soon before an action is taken should a survey be done to be considered valid? And that varies. Uh, 
by its species, and and usually we specify in the survey protocol that um, you know if survey results done according to this protocol, we'll consider for consultation purposes for two years or whatever, and it, and it varies by the species and and uh, just how variable their distribution is. I mean, some species, once you find them in a spot and you know they're there, that's where they're going to be. So that could have a longer shelf life. Uh, other things uh, are, are not so, you know, longer shelf life. I was wondering if there's going to be a protocol developed for the porta bonded bat. We have our own methodology that we've been using with success, but I was under the impression that there would be a protocol it hasn't been developed. Okay, but is it still going to be? I hope it will. Don't work on it. That's what I've heard for quite a while. Yeah. Okay, so you're in the same place as us. Thanks. Okay, we're a little out ahead of schedule. This is good. I think we are on schedule for a break after this session. Yeah. So let's let's take a 15-minute break. Let's be back here at 20 to 10.